doesn't, you know, so I'm forever you saying that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'm forever saying that today for work. I'm like, you can't get angry at him. You just can't tell him that what he's doing is wrong. You can't really be naughty to him. So he's pushing the boundary. He knows that he knows he's pushing the boundary. Yeah. But he doesn't know that what he's doing is not what he's doing. Like, so I'm like, you can't, you know, you can't yeah. ignore him. Easy, easy to say for work. How old is he? Right, good evening everybody. Uh, welcome to tonight's uh, policy board. Just before the meeting then, I just want to make sure, particularly for the members of the public here tonight, in the case of a fire, a bell will ring. If this occurs, please leave the building immediately, following the green fire exit signs to the assembly point, which is by the War Memorial on Duke Street. If you need any assistance, please let us know and don't use the lifts. Remain at the assembly point and don't attempt to return to the building until you've been advised that it's safe to do so. Anyone attending this meeting is entitled to film it, but you need to make sure that you only film the councillors and the officers in this part of the building. And make sure you've switched off your mobile phones as well, please. So apologies for absence. Thank you, Chair. I've had apologies from councillors Gulliver, Knight, Roberts and Whitehead. Thank you. Uh, minutes of the last meeting. Does anybody have any points they want to make about those minutes? Okay, I'll take those as being correct. Right, we come to public questions. Uh, hopefully you've all seen public questions that have come out. We have four public questions. Are they all here tonight? Or? I'm not sure all of them are here. Okay, uh, so we'll hear, we'll hear your questions uh, and then we'll have a presentation <coughs> about the master plan at Great Lees and hopefully lots of your questions will be answered during that presentation but if not we'll address them specifically afterwards. So Mr Booley, would you like to ask your question? Oh, it's not here, sorry. Someone moved. I thought that was you. Uh, Mr. Uh, we'll note Mr. Booley's question. Mr. Pugh? Chair, if it's okay, would it be possible for Mr. Daniels to go first because of the natural flow from his question and statement onto mine? Okay? I'm more than happy to. Uh, Mr. Daniels. Where would you like me? In front of the microphone, please. Okay. Thank you. Would you like to give your name and address, please? Well... Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the applicants. Oh, okay. okay. Good evening, members, and thank you to officers for the comprehensive report that's been prepared. I'm here to speak in support of the Great Lease Master Plan on behalf of the Consortium of Landowners and Developers. The Master Plan represents the culmination of a great deal of detailed design and technical work. The final proposals have been developed alongside both council and county level officers. There has also been extensive engagement more widely involving key local stakeholders and members of the public. Therefore, we're naturally pleased that officers are endorsing the master plan subject to a small number of further considerations. The consortium wishes to make the following comment on these. Upgrading of Chase Side Bridge to improve accessibility for cyclists, paragraph 3.33 of the report. In response to this further consideration, the consortium are happy for the final master plan version to include a requirement to investigate in more detail the feasibility and viability of improvements to the Chase Side bridge route for cyclists within the context of the retention of the existing bridge structure. We trust that this suggestion is helpful and can be agreed, and we request that members support the officer recommendations. 
I'm joined by the master plan architect, Mr. Pugh, and highway specialist, alongside representatives from the consortium here this evening. Together, we would be very happy to answer any detailed queries. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Pugh. Thank you. Yeah, so my name is Simon Pugh from uh, David Lock Associates. I'm a partner there. Uh, we're the master planning consultant working on the production of the Great Lees master plan for uh, the wider consortium of developers and landowners. Again, uh, good evening, members. Um, in addition to Joseph Daniel's statement, I'd like to cover a couple of additional points also relating to Site 7A. Firstly, in relation to building heights and density. We suggest the inclusion of clarifying text to the legend within the building heights plan in response to comments proposing lowering of heights along the northern edge of the two neighbourhood centre parcels um, uh, within the uh, document. The height plan currently sets up to a maximum of three storeys for the neighbourhood centre parcels, which are not set building heights, but up to parameters only. It's normal practice that building heights and specific building locations are determined through rigorous process of PPAs and planning application work informed by technical assessments, including heritage assessment and landscape and visual assessment, undertaking testing of set viewpoints and provision of building wirelines. We propose the building heights including, included in the document in relation to this point remain unchanged, but are qualified by the following additional wording to ensure robust and robust and defendable position for the planning authority. Actual building heights and locations in the context of sensitive receptors listed buildings to be tested and determined by technical input through planning application <coughs> preparation to include landscape and visual impact assessment. Secondly, in relation to the access to the northern parcel of 7A from Molson Hall Lane, the landowner is disappointed that officers cannot at this time, this time support the proposed access, despite significant evidence and benefits put forward. In the absence of a robust highways reasoning for this decision, we accept the removal of the access for the purposes of approving the framework master plan, but the landowner reserves the right to pursue this issue further through the planning application at a later date. Thank you. Thank you. And Mrs Compton-Cook. No, not here. Okay, we note uh, her question and her comments. Thank you, everybody. Uh, any declarations of interest from members? No? Okay, so we move on then to the, the, the item for tonight, the Great Lees Master Plan. Uh, Mr Perry. Who... Thank, thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm just a lector behind you, Chair. So, um, Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Matthew Perry, Planning Officer with Strategic Development, here this evening to present the Master Plan for Great Lees, Strategic Growth Site Policy 7. I'm going to start off to give some context for benefit of everyone. So what we have on the screen is a split, or, or the local plan policy um, designations, uh, split between 7A, B, C and D. I'm just going to briefly describe those. Obviously, we, we are in Great Lees, um, just north of the settlement you can see to the south of this image. On the western side, you will see 7A, known as Land at Morsham Hall. Um, to the east, uh, northeast, you'll see 7B, Land off London Road. 7C, Land North and south of Banters Lane. Just a quick explanation of that is that 7C does split Banters Lane. Um, as you can see, 7C North uh, just breaches into um, an area known as, as Banters Field, uh, just north of, of Banters Lane. 7D, known as Land East of Main Road, is pretty much um, built out now, Bellway scheme. Don't intend to concentrate too much on that. As I said, there, there is some relevance to access for 7C that I'll discuss later, but that is, um, I say, pretty much built out now as part of um, previous permissions. Briefly touch on policy requirements. I don't intend to spend too long on these. I'll just pull out the, the key elements of the policy requirements for each of, of the three um, allocations to be um, discussed this evening. Those are all within the local plan. So I say these are abbreviated, summarised for the benefit of, of this evening, just to give members and members of public a flavour. 
So 7A, we're dealing with around 750 new homes. Travelling show person site, referred to as TSP uh, for short during the report. TSP site for five plots, uh, new neighbourhood centre, primary school with co-located early years and childcare nursery. Um, a requirement to co-locate that neighbourhood centre with primary school uh, at a location close to existing links. Main vehicle, main vehicle access taken from Morsham Hall Lane, pedestrian cycle connections and a well-connected internal layout which allows for bus priority measures. Similar comments for, for 7B, just note that it is for 250 specialist residential homes for older persons. Um, that's the requirements part of the allocation. Main vehicle access from London, London Road, pedestrian cycle connections as per 7A, and a well-connected layout as per 7A and the others. 7C, we have around 100 new homes uh, proposed. Main vehicle access proposed within the local plan allocation was from Banters Lane all through uh, site 7D uh, via Main Road. I'll touch upon this later uh, in the presentation. Pedestrian cycle links, as I've said before, uh, well-connected layout, uh, allowing for bus, bus priority measures, uh, which I'll briefly discuss later as well. Just wanted to touch upon um, land ownership because it, because it is relevant to um, the jigsaw that's been put together in terms of the allocations. The Office of Report notes this, it's, it's all within the public domain. We have green areas um, owned by John Holmes as well as um, land shown in orange under John Holmes' control also. As you'll see, that, that covers both 7B and the north element of 7C in, in that position. We have 7A, um, slightly west of John Holmes' ownership, controlled by Bellway and Red Row, 50-50 split. And across the other side, we have um, the blue areas, or the light blue area, controlled by Bellway. The darker blue area, already kind of built out by Bellway, uh, currently, um, well, sorry, known as the Furlongs development. So that's pretty much um, completed at this time. And just note, there is um, a darker or a purple area seen as 7C, which is in completely separate ownership, um, and that is controlled by Landvest Developments. Um, that, that will explain um, some of the access arrangements that, that are in, within the report. So in terms of the main diagram, um, members and members of the public will be familiar with this framework plan, which is basically the main diagram that you will see within the master plan document. I just briefly want to touch upon some of the key components. I say it's set out within the report. Um, it's very want to see in the master plan, but we're just giving a flavour this evening. 7A, we have a mix of uses, um, the yellow blocks, parcels, shown to be residential blocks, as you would expect. Within the centre of 7A, we have um, the blue area denoting the school location, uh, just to the right of that to the east. We have the neighbourhood centre shown in, in the pink colour with a, with a further parcel of residential um, as we reach new roundabout. The um, bus loop is shown in red, but I'll touch upon that in, in the access accessibility section shortly. And we have various routes uh, permeating that through spine route and, and other road networks um, through there. 7B, um, to, the, to the east of London Road, we have, well, it is mainly residential, um, split into um, roughly two parcels there as for the mass plan, which represents a current application, live application for the northern segment for 190 units, again referred to in the report. And 7C, again, predominantly residential. Um, so the officer report talks about the parcels. Um, it says that officers are broadly um, in, in, well, officers are broadly accepting of those parcels subject to some tweaks um, as notified in the further considerations.
Thank you. Um, I'll just br briefly revisit the, um, so the conclusion of, of the report was that the parcels are seen as broadly acceptable, should, subject to a few tweaks as identified in the report. So to so pull out some key issues from the report, um, so the report notes there's three key issues that, that are sought to be dealt with in, in the front part of the report. One being location of the travelling show person site. Um, two, the extension of built form beyond the settlement boundary in the northern northern segment. And three, the access to the northern parcel um, of 7A from Morsham Hall Lane. The report does go through these in, in some detail. I just briefly want to touch upon these this evening um, just to give a bit of a brief overview um, of those key points. So in terms of the, the TSP site, um, located... Um, within an area known locally as the island site. So the report outlines, uh, well, reflects what the mass, what the mass plan document um, basically evaluates difficulties within um, 7B in, in locating the TSP site within the designated allocation. Obviously the report notes that the TSP site is located outside of the allocation. Um, it is located within a special policy area also. The image to the left shows the, the black line, which um, navigates around the racecourse land as well as um, some quarry land to, to the north. But that black line does obviously cross the 131 to encompass the, the, the island site um, to a fuller extent, struck right down to the, um, the, round, the former, former roundabout for, for London Road and, and the 131. So... The, the office report accepts it in the special policy area, accepts there is a, there is a conflict in that respect. The policy area is, is designated specifically for uh, benefit of racecourse, ancillary racecourse development um, in order to give some planning freedoms in an area of, of constraint, it being with the, within a rural area. So the policy, the policy report looks at, the, looks at the pros and cons, the benefits um, of the TSP site in this, in this location. We do have a, a willing landowner here. Landowner is the same as we see on some of the, some of the parcels. Um, so this, this type of recommendation is not taken lightly by officers, but it's felt that there is... Uh, we do have a live plan application running parallel at the moment. Um, the, the officer report does note that there are amendments, in our view, necessary to that, specifically to reduce the number of access points from four down to two. The two access points are shown within the master, within the master plan. Officers have seen some further technical drawings and evidence that show that that can be accommodated within that site. It does have its constraints, obviously. Um, um, trees for one, ecology. Um, we, have, we have noise issues associated with uh, the 131. However, we don't, don't think those um, issues are insurmountable in terms of uh, a future plan application. And it's presented today to members to endorse, accept the principle, um, albeit with a constraining factor on the number of access points. So that, that's what um, officers will seek for approval um, this evening. The second issue, the settlement settle boundary, you'll see from the plan the red line that basically cuts across roughly east-west, across that, that field boundary. That is the, def the new defined settlement for this defined settlement boundary for Great Lees as per the allocation map. Um, the rationale behind that uh, at examination and, and prior to that was in order to preserve the setting of a uh, nearby listed building um, dotted in red there, tri known as Triceratops. So that, that was intended to give give some protection um, in order to pull back that line. It wouldn't, it's because it doesn't necessarily, well, it doesn't follow the field boundary. Um, in that respect, it cuts across that field. As you can see, the hedgerows do wrap northeast, northeast and, and, and west of that line. So what we have presented in the master plan is, is an extension of built form beyond that red line. The officer report notes it to be a technical breach. Um, we, we, th there's no getting away from that but it does offer analysis of, of those merits. So in considering that, mindful of the listed building, uh, mindful of the technical breach, um, but there are some, some positives in terms of um, improvements to the natural hedgerows closing off that field parcel. Um, so it fits quite naturally within the kind of natural field boundary there. There are some recommendations made within the officer report uh, following consultation with our listed building officer, um, which seek for 
a slightly greater setback. Um, so I think we're around 72 up to 80 metres from Triceratops. So a, a further inset from that from that property, and uh, an alteration to the scale plan shown within there, so that um, office can be content that scale is reduced on that western edge as we get closer to um, the listed building. So in essence, you know, we recognise it's this technical breach. Again, officer report looks for members to endorse that, that change um, because you know, we have to accept that it does breach beyond the settlement boundary. It doesn't, of course, breach beyond the allocation as a whole. Uh, members will note that north of that we do have the green area no, no, notated as a recreation area, so it doesn't breach the, kind of the outer limits of the allocation but does breach the, de the defined settlement boundary. In terms of Morsham Hall Lane access, this is um, one of the matters that officers don't feel that we can endorse and present to members favourably. Um, I, I think, as, as, as Mr. Mr. Pugh noted, there are there has been some further work gone into this by by the applicants in order to convince us that this is a workable solution. So that that access is shown to basically create a, a separate access for the northern parcel, which is in the northern extremity of the allocation. We'll have some difficulties in accessing because obviously the main road, the main spider, spine road has to go through from from further south, Morsham Hall Lane, off the main road through the development parcels to get to this northern extremity. So officers are, are mindful of the potential benefits in buildability, deliverability, the potential for an emergency access in, in this location. But it's just felt from officers' point of view, there are some negatives associated with this. Um, firstly, highways objection in principle in terms of breaking out uh, onto Morsham Hall Lane, the, you know, the option to travel north to the 120 or, or, or the potential incentive to do so, um, and obviously the rural nature of that lane. So highways objection in, in principle. The list of buildings, we've got listed buildings north um, in terms of the two cottages and also Morsham Hall South. Ecology and trees, um, there is obviously an impact in terms of breaking through that hedgerow and tree line. There are preserved trees along there. Whilst it may not necessarily result in their removal, that is quite not quite detailed out at this point. So officers you know, maintain the concern about, about the impact upon natural features there. And also bear in mind that it does cut across what is designated a recreation zone. It's, it's, it's a more of a minor point, but you know, we, you know, the proposal is to kind of hug the um, southern edge of uh, of the allocation there, but that is a slight negative in, in officers' view. So, uh, as members will see, the recommendation from officers is that this element is deleted. Um, obviously, you've heard from um, the applicant just that they reserve their right to um, detail this out further or submit a plan application. Obviously, we will deal with that on its merits at, at a point in the future, but officers don't feel that we can offer support to that at this point. As I said, I, I didn't want to um, go through the whole report in detail, but one of the areas that I did want to touch upon in, in a bit of detail was, was accessibility. Um, obviously, part of the vision for um, Great Lees within the master plan is this interconnectivity, a, a landscape-led approach, but this interconnectivity, uh, a sustainable transport mode. So just want to deal with three key points in terms of vehicle routes, pedestrian, cycle routes, and, and bridleway. And then I'll move on to just to sum up the recommendation. So if I could briefly, um, in terms of vehicle routes, um, obviously uh, I've explained that, that the main vehicle access will be off Morsham Hall Lane, a new um, mini roundabout off the main roundabout that that, it, that is seen on the 131. Um, that main route will travel westwards um, as a bus route. It is the main spine route. It's a bus route that then loops, uh, the bus route shown in red, loops within the western parcel in order to give coverage for um, proximity to bus stops, both to the southern parcel and the northern parcels. Um, that main spine route does travel northwards into um, the, the the parcel north of uh, Phyllis Curry uh, Nature Reserve. Um, the, currently, the master plan is shown to be an emergency access only beyond that middle parcel into the self-built parcel, the, the northernmost parcel. But uh, as as I've said before, because officers aren't comfortable with the separate access at that point further north, 
um, that would involve, well, it wouldn't necessitate a change to that mass plan document to enable uh, vehicular routing um, into that northern zone from the main from the main parcels of 7A. So, other things worth mentioning within 7A, um, obviously. The, the, the framework plan doesn't show every road on there. That's not a, the intention of the master plan. It shows the bus route and the main spine road and some um, and some ancillary roads that serve other parcels around, but it's not intended to show every single route uh, within those parcels. That This is a high-level document intended to show how we get in and out, how the parcels are accessed. Um, the other thing to mention is that there is a, there is a route shown that's a pedestrian cycle route um, south onto or through the southern... Um, most um, parcel onto school lane that is shown to be an emergency access route for vehicles um, again that would be suitably bollarded only used in emergencies um, and highways um, are accept accepting of that in principle um, given that that use would be very limited in reality and only in emergency um, so just, just, just to flip over to the side of, of London Road, obviously 7B, uh, we, we've got two access points shown as part of the master plan. Uh, again, highways have sought, sought to limit the number of access points um, within within that. That has been reduced from the July uh, revision of the master plan. So you know, we're looking at two access points in there, which is broadly seen as acceptable with a, with a route, uh, a network within that parcel um, so that those parcels can be joined uh, together. Worth mentioning the TSP site again, vehicular routing within there is shown as two access points within the master plan. In terms of 7C, so the land vest parcel, the north of that, so south of Banters Lane, is shown with a, a separate access to probably deal with um, you know 10, 10 to a dozen properties potentially within within that smaller parcel. The main vehicular route within um, well, to serve 7C will be from 7D, um, and that in, in turn will come from Main Road. So that will go through the existing um, uh, dwellings, so the 100 dwellings within 7D that are currently built out, that will travel through. Uh, I know there's been representations made from uh, existing residents there, uh, but just the report notes that you know, the intention was that it was a neither or scenario and uh, that is seen as appropriate by highways rather than using the northern uh, the northern access point to serve the entire parcel of that around 100 units. Pedestrian cycle routes, um, again, is a big topic within. I uh, just want to touch upon briefly. Uh, I know, you know, obviously, we have a, a debating session after, but in terms of pedestrian routes, um, so we have... Um, between village, uh, existing village and, and new development, we have, have, have pretty essentially four key points. We have um, school school lane bridge. Uh, we then have trace side bridge further north than that, shown, shown the green arrow on here. We then have um, the underpass next to the Dog and Partridge uh, public house. And we then have a proposed new crossing just south of the roundabout. So four key crossing points um, there. Obviously, there are some recommendations made within the report. Uh, the key one, as mentioned by um, Mr. Daniels, um, uh, Chase Side Bridge is, is an area of, of not necessarily agreement between um, certainly highways officers, officers and, and developers at the moment. Um, but I'm happy to touch upon that further as part of um, discussion. So, in essence, there'll be a, a formalised uh, crossing point um, just south of 131, which will hopefully achieve LTN 120 compliance, which is a highway standard they're looking for at the moment. Dog and Partridge has, has some constraints because of the nature of the size of the underpass. Um, Chaseside Bridge has its constraints. Um, it's currently a pedestrian bridge um, whereby cyclists do have to dismount across there. And School Lane is part of the existing Sustrand cycle network in any case, but um, improvements suggested by highways to enable um, easier walk-in uh, along along that route, so four four key connections. Then within the site, we obviously have um, permutation within their seven uh, A in terms of routes that travel um, kind of south northwards um, and across to School Lane as well to break out onto School um, School Lane West. In terms of seven um, B and C, there there is an option shown to to basically break through the centre point of. Um, or, or between 7D and 7C, 
travel along the eastern boundary, along the eastern boundary of 7B, and then break out onto London Road, and then travel northwards to the TSP site. Again, there's an aspiration to join up northwards to enable um, Cycle Network to join into the Sustrans route north, which will enable um, access to um, Notley and Braintree beyond. Um, briefly touch upon on bridleways. There is a bridleway improvement shown. Um, so the the current underpass um, next to the public public house goes through uh, through the underpass, and then you would turn right towards Morsham Hall Lane. Uh, what's shown within within the master plan framework and also within the, the wider documents is a is a route that that travels um, east west out to uh, Dumney Lane to the west enables use of the byway to travel northwards that enables a rejoining to the allocation um, to circumvent um, in the northern area of the recreation zone then back onto Morsham Hall Lane so in, in essence creating that loop for for horse riders so that's seen as a positive seen as an, seen as an improvement um, so that that's um, welcomed by the Broadway Association in their representation so say um, brief presentation there's obviously lots more um, issues and topics to, to discuss um, but in terms of the officer recommendation so master plan considered broadly acceptable there is obviously a number of further considerations mainly focused on highways um, requirements suggestions that are endorsed by the local planning authority so there's a request for a number of amendments but that is not unusual it's not it's not unusual in terms of presentation to policy board um, in terms of in terms of other master plans before members so the, the recommendation beyond that is then for uh, members to approve subject to those further changes being delegated back to officers thank you chair thank you um, did we want to address any of the public questions or? Um, I think um, Matthew um, can address some of those in particular, in, in, in particular the residents' questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll just, uh, just bear with me a second while I um, blank the screen to get a relevant um, slide up. Thank you. So as a, a pre-prepared slide, obviously um, seeing the representations uh, from uh, Mr. Booley, um, I have an image there of, of the rear of, of his property. So um, the, the the diagram um, to the to the right-hand side um, essentially outlines uh, a pair of cottages. Um, concern being in terms of proximity of that residential parcel, obviously shown in yellow. I think that in, in response to concerns, I think that officers would say that as part of the detailed discussions on an outline application or reserve matters or even a full application for that parcel, I think we're confident that we could achieve an acceptable separation distance there as per our development management requirements. I think that, I think that officers are, are quite willing to acknowledge um, and with members' agreement that um, in order to acknowledge that concern, I don't see an issue with pulling that parcel back necessarily from um, that residential property. Um, you know, I don't have a concern from the developers in terms of the arrangement there. As I say, in reality, that would have happened in any case. I think that um, you know, I have no issue with, as you see, just the left-hand side of that. There is um, a green area shown to the west. Obviously, the one to the east is, is more substantial because that's related to um, providing a setting to, to Gubbion's Hall further south. Um, so I have no issue if members are in agreement to recommending a change that the, the buffer is, is carried along um, that southern boundary to wrap around those two properties. I don't think that prejudice is... Uh, the development parcel, particularly in any way, anything that wouldn't have, have happened in any case once officers dealt with this uh, at development management stage. So I think there's, a, there's acknowledgement that um, um, in terms of the representation that, that that can be addressed through a minor change to the master plan or the framework plan in, in this case. Um, just bear in mind that there is, um, there is a green arrow shown on, on the right-hand side diagram that does show a potential crossing point. So 
members will note there is a recommendation for that to be moved further west because of concerns about um, visibility around the bend on Banters Lane in that position. So, in effect, um, there'll be um, there'll be a restriction on what development can actually get that close to Banters Lane. And I think that the uh, the landscape buffering that's shown to Banters Lane at the moment is in response to officer concern about any properties that would specifically front Banters Lane, both in terms of visibility uh, on that kind of rural lane as it is at the moment, but, but also in terms of um, restricting any access points or individual access points along there to serve individual, individual dwellings. So I think you know we would anticipate that parcel to be served um, through vehicles from the pink arrow that you see north of that, so through 7B, there'll be an access through to 7C in this location. So I say, note, note the neighbour concerns. Um, I don't think it, it warrants um, holding up the master plan at this point. I think it can be it can be dealt with a, with a with a minor change to the framework plan if members are in agreement. Members in agreement with that? Or? I, if I heard Mr. Jordan correctly, there were two alternatives he was suggesting, leaving it to the stage where the development management stage would, would, would in, ensure the distancing and the protection, or whether we should physically move the boundaries of the particular parcel so that, so that that is fulfilled at this stage. In the interest of clarity for the, uh, the resident, I think it would be beneficial to specifically change the boundary to achieve this, to achieve what, what officers are saying is broadly acceptable. <clears throat> so that's what I would like, that's what I would prefer to see. And I would also like to uh, enable officers, or uh, instruct, I suppose is the word, officers to respond to this particular objector and to outline our approach to meeting those objections. I think um, as, uh as uh, Mr. Perry said, um, there are two approaches. Um, I think um, for consistency and f to ensure, as you say, um, planning committee know what the parameters are um, now, then I think it would be worth us extending the green buffer um, to um, provide that level of separation at the master plan stage. So that's what um, we, can, we can try and do. Yep. I addressed Mr. Perry as Mark by mistake. Okay, so the recommendation is we put in a green buffer there around that property to uh, ensure that uh, his property isn't being overlooked by buildings of a that's you know, going to be too close to it. Is that okay? Okay, thank you. Next one. Chair, um, just bear with me a second. I'm just putting up another slide to deal with. Um, the second public representation, which I believe was in relation to um, uh, specifically the um, TSP site. So um, just bear with me for one minute. Okay, so uh, as, as I've said uh, as part of the presentation, there are pros and cons, there are merits uh, and disadvantages to um, the TSP site, uh, which, I, which officer report runs through. I think the the representation deals with an issue with the principal, which I say the officer report has dealt with. Um, I think that officers are uh, comfortable with the principal, and that's what we're seeking members to endorse. In terms of, in terms of traffic uh, movements and use of large vehicles, I think that I would like to bring in um, a highways officers just for a, a, a small comment on that but but essentially london road is is de-restricted um it does have heavy goods vehicles um using it at the moment um so i don't believe there's an issue in terms of usage um, of that road for larger vehicles that would be associated with um, a tsp site um, as i stated before there are some um, technical details around the access arrangements in terms of site displays and um, the relationship with the with the road network in terms of uh, visibility displays and access into into that parcel, uh, which I say have an element of confidence that that can be dealt with. Uh, further work has been done on that, and that will be to be detailed as far as part of the plan application. Um, 
if I could just um, revert to Miss um, Gore or, or Miss Curry, if I could, on um, usage of um, London Road, if I may, if that's okay. Um, we, we've um, explored this in quite a lot of detail um, with, with the, the consortium, um, and um, the, uh, the proposals will be to um, extend the accessibility routes in terms of cycling and walking along London Road. Um, so that would probably involve things like um, looking at speed limits, reducing speed limits, traffic management, um, really to um, discourage a lot of through traffic from the main development going along there. So we wouldn't see that it, it would be uh, become a lot more intensified in terms of use. Um, at, the, at the moment, um, there are um, there's a, a um, like a depot uh, um, haulage firm in Young's End that goes up and down there. Uh, it, that doesn't seem to cause a problem. The road's suitable for heavy goods vehicles. In terms of travelling show people, it's quite infrequent the number of um, trips that they um, they um, make to the, the TSP site because it tends to be at the end of a season. It's, it's travelling show people rather than um, you know day-to-day -day, um, traveling travelers using the site. So they are um, very infrequent, not in peak hours. Um, they are large vehicles, but the road is entirely suitable. And as I said, we're, we're looking at traffic management measures um, to um, ensure that London Road is not used widely as a rat run for traffic, mainly from you know from from the from the development. So the the levels of traffic that would be expected can be accommodated um, along London Road, probably without even really noticing the difference with with the development in place. Could I ask a question to the officer there about London Road? Um, people walking from these developments uh, along the footway to uh, Bracknot and Eve for the supermarket, etc. The footway around the, the just to the north of the pub, the Green Dragon, is extremely narrow. I can recall taking my father's walker a few years ago, and it was barely wide enough for the walker, and nobody could walk beside him. So anybody taking a pushchair up to the supermarket um, in Black Notley, the Tesco's, would have a problem. So uh, when you're envisaging the work on London Road, uh, widening the footway, um, there would be necessary. We want people to walk from these developments up to the um, to Tesco's or uh, even the employment facilities in Black Notley. Uh, this is going to be extremely difficult and if you the question of large trucks brushing against the edge of the road with a two foot wide footway war b bothers me that's something that we are very aware of um, one one thing that tends to happen on, on routes like that is that there tends to be a lot of overgrowth on footways so the actual amount of footway is, is larger than it appears on site because of the lots, lots of the, the verge grows over the footway. So that's one of the things that you do to start with is clear it back and that would provide a, a wider footway in the first instance. And then um, when we are looking at the detailed design stage for the planning application, um, the, um, we, we'd look for a combined facility for cycling and walking, which would um, provide a wider path both for cyclists and for pedestrians along that whole route because what we want to do is we want to connect the, the Great Lease sites all the way along London Road to the London Road A131 roundabout and then have a continuous route onto Horizon 120, Great Notley, and to the potential um, development at um, East Notley within the Braytree district so that it's all joined up and we want as good a facilities as we can for pedestrians and cyclists along that whole route. So absolutely, yes, that, that's something that we will make sure is looked at in detail at the, at the planning application stage. Thank you, Chair. And just to um, supplement that, um, I mean, this route of, um, is probably going to be of primary use by people who may want to be 
employed somewhere um, outside um, of of the of Great Lees and and um, and connections up into those employment areas, and probably secondary school children as well, because of Notley High School being the closest um, secondary school to to this site. It probably be, would be less so for the day-to-day -day kind of convenience needs of the residents here, because of course they are going to have a brand new neighbourhood centre with convenience store uh, shops and probably with you know with healthcare and community facilities. So it's probably those kind of longer trips, which are likely to be cycling rather than walking, um, is going to be um, the main issue along London Road. But I think the point um, um, Ms. Gore said is that um, effectively um, the travelling show person site is going to be um, negligent in terms of the number or in the amount of new um, um, traffic flow that's going to be along London Road. I don't think it would it would probably could would even um, amount to um, anything in terms of any kind of count in the future. So in terms of in terms of the development creating develop. Um, um, uh, flow along London Road, I would suspect that's going to be relatively small. Uh, would the improvements to London Road be a section 106 likely? Yeah, that's right. So it would be an off-site section 106 requirement obligation on the developers. And uh, from the question, and uh, her concern was about the sort of green green wedge between Great Notley and uh, and Great Lees. Is there likely to that to be lost? Or um, our start and uh, Mr. Perry can um, supplement this. But I mean, first of all, um, as Mr. Perry said, the the site in question is within the special planning uh, policy area of the of the racecourse as it stands. So, in in some regards, the principle of um, other types of development has been accepted in the local plan in on that island um, site. Or, albeit though they are related more to the racecourse. The other thing I think probably we just ought to clarify is the fact that it's a little bit misleading that plan. That purple doesn't actually show the significant kind of um, um, tree line and buffer uh, in particular to the north of uh, within that site. So um, I think we just need to be mindful of the fact that, you know, there is existing landscaping and it isn't the entirety of the island site that's been developed. So, of course, new development in there is going to have an impact. Um, but in the context of all the development that's happening around it and the race course, um, I wouldn't say that there's going to be a material erosion of, uh, of, of, of that gap in that, in that location. So there's no plan for, as far as we know, for building opposite the TSP or, and further north to Young's End? So um, opposite the TSP is, um, I think it's the woodland there, Linders Wood. Um, I think, um, some of that is outside of our um, area, I believe. It may well be in Braintree there, but I think the boundary's um, um, a little bit odd. So opposite there is, um, is a woodland. Um, to the south, along the island site, I think I'll just defer to Mr Perry. Thank, thank you, Mr Potter. Um, I'll just put up a, an aerial uh, picture on, on the screen just to show um, the woody belt. So uh, land safe, I think that... If I just refer back to the officer report, because it is relevant to members that um, this land does form part of, um, obviously, the special policy area for the race course, but it, it, is, it does form part of the um, governing permission as part of the 2003 planning permission uh, for which to enable the race course to be built out. Obviously, that permission is clearly implemented um, by, by virtue of the race course and its ancillary items being developed out since, since that time. Um, so. The the, um, the officer report does does note that the island site, which is a wider or, or longer version of, of what we see in purple there, uh, which travels down to the roundabout, was actually uh, part of um, the development proposals, a part of the 2003 planning permission, uh, which enabled parking and further stabling within within there. So, 
you know, the reality is that, that this could legitimately be built out as part of that planning permission. Um, obviously, not going to be the case. Um, the report notes that, um, that that is not a requirement of current race course operations. Um, so there is some already some precedent set for um, development within this purple pass, as you see, but also for for the south. Um, the, I have no plans, or officers have no plans before us in terms of any other type of development. But obviously, that would be captured by a special policy area still, um, in terms of land further south. Um, I think that the representation might also have been concerned with uh, development further north. Obviously, the further north we go, uh, we do break into Notley, who have uh, wider aspirations for an extension um, kind of um, um, southeast. Um, so I think th there might have been concerns from the representation as I read them that this is just one step to developing something further north. But uh, however, you know, that would that would fall rural areas outside the defined settlement boundary as, as, as revised. And it's outside of the special policy area as well. So we are into areas of constraint, albeit that the character of this area will uh, inevitably change um, due to the size of, of this allocation. Um, just in terms of other comments from um, that representation, um, noting of, of conservation of woodland and so forth. So the report notes there is some small loss of, of trees within there. But again, I'll come back to the fact that, you know, this does have permission to be built out in some form for for, for, for parking and, and, sta uh, uh, and stabling. So um, this, you know, this has a legitimate reason to be um, developed out as part of a, 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 another permission. So it's not as if this land is going to remain as such uh, and wouldn't expect it to be so as part of the special policy area either. So, I say, in terms of conservation woodland, there are obviously constraints here. Um, a lot of this allocation has constraints, natural constraints, trees, ecology, and so forth. Um, and, and it's for the plan application to detail that out. Um, offices don't have significant concerns over that. I think there is a loss of seven trees that were, were C-rated according the officer report so so there's not an overriding concern in terms of um, loss of habitat or, or loss of um, trees in this location so I wouldn't necessarily agree with um, the comments made from the representation in, in, in that respect um, in terms of some of the other comments you know talk about um, house value and, and so forth I don't think it's appropriate and it's not a material pl planning consideration um, to deal with that uh, at this point in terms of the comments about sellability of uh, of 7A, um, I think that what's been put forward in the master plan is is some de technical difficulties within 7A. Officers, um, as part of our stage zero, uh, before um, developers necessarily get involved with putting drawings on plans, you know, officers officers obviously scope out or DM officers scope out potential locations for these land uses, and you know we do have to recognise there are some real difficulties in, in placing the TSP site within 7A um, in terms of the constraint of, of those parcels and proximity to um, new new residential areas as well as school and um, neighbourhood centre. So I so say the report runs through the principle um, and, and officers are, are seeking support from members today on this issue. Thank you. Lindos Wood Lane, as shown, is actually the boundary between our district and Braintree. So this big field is green. I don't know if that means it's uh, woodland. Would be in our area, uh, whereas on the other side and, and around Young's End, as mentioned by her, is in uh, Braintree District, which may he, she would have to consult Braintree about their development in uh, not the east. Well, I think the southern part of Young's End is in Chelmsford. A bit south of the roundabout is in Chelmsford, but the bit north is in Braintree. Yeah, it is, yeah. It's a little thin bit. Uh, any co other comments? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I understand that one of the concerns locally um, with moving the uh, TSP into the, uh, the island site is around screening. Um, you talked about, about trees earlier, um, particularly in the winter months, so the... the uh, the site would be more visible. Um, and I just wonder if any thoughts have been given to that, really. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I think that 
There is a, there is already a substantial um, tree belt which is preserved on on the eastern edge. I think that um, inevitably we would look for um, supplementary landscaping where possible. But I think the nature of of, uh, of that parcel, as you can see on on the left hand aerial, um, it is, is it is constrained in terms of its its dimensions. Um, there is a significant um, tree belt shown uh, within there um, along that frontage, and. You know, really, from from roadside, it does it does provide a uh, probably a better buffer than you know one can imagine if this was was, was to be placed in Banters Field, for example, whereby the trees are, are a lot more sparse within there would require additional planting. I think we do have also have scope uh, along the 131 to provide uh, landscaping behind um, those those potential well essentially workshop units that would be associated with a TSP site. So supplementary landscaping would you know, be an ordinary consideration of development management that obviously we would seek to supplement and obviously any loss will need to be compensated. Thank you. Councillor Willis. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm in the unfortunate position tonight that I, my hearing aid has gone missing, so I haven't been able to hear everything that's gone on. Uh, but um, this would appear to be the right moment to uh, mention my um, responses to two of the public questions. I thought the one about, from Banters Lane about the um, extending the, um, uh, the buffer extension was a very good one, so I hope that that can be met. Um, and the, I, I'd just like to record, um, m many members will not be familiar with um, the um, showground travellers' sites. Um, and uh, the first period I was on the council, I was actually representing Rittle, which has no less than three. But I didn't know it. The only time I found out that there were any at all was when there was a, an application to increase the density on one of the sites. Um, but right up until that time, I didn't have a single complaint or grievance arriving from that. Um, and um, incidentally, it's these, this is a very modest site five units is not large. You know, the site that many people will have heard of and be concerned about down at, um, is it Dale Farm, down in um, uh, 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 the um, Cray's Hill, um, has something more like 50 units on there. Um, and there are indeed many problems associated with that. But this is a modest site, well chosen, I think. And, um, you know, and as for the threat to mental health, well, you'll gather what threat uh, would be my reaction to that. Um, and um, so, uh, uh, to, to the extent that, um, you know, anybody present is involved in that particular situation, um, well, all, all I can say is um, that was not my experience in Rittle. Um, you're only going to get into mental health problems if you allow yourself to worry unnecessarily, which I appreciate that some people may do, but that's not the responsibility of the developer. Thank you, Chairman. I'll just come back um, on that. Um, Chair, if that's um, okay. I mean, first of all, just to just for the policy boards, um, just to remind the policy board, as as, as Councillor Woodis said, um, this is for a travelling show person site. It is a gypsy and traveller site. So just to make sure that we, um, you know, that you know, absolutely got the, the the terminology right and the use right, a travelling show person site is akin to a kind of a light commercial. A light industrial site, um, where, where as um, as was stated earlier, um, um, overwintering and the storage of um, 
normally fairground equipment yeah. is is um, the predominant use um, of of the site, rather than being um, what's more a traditional um, gypsy and traveller site. So that's that's that was one point, and I think the second point is that I think uh, the buffer. I think we, um, as we said earlier, um, I think we can encompass that um, through negotiations with the developer. Okay. The, uh, the, the other point I should have made, Chairman, was that um, it's in the nature of these um, sites that they are empty half the year. During the spring and summer months, they're out running shows, you know, um, in various locations to which they move, um, they're, not on, they're not on these sites. And that relates to this question of storage. They may well store stuff there when they're not present, but that's not the same thing at all. Um, and that's another good reason for not you know, getting concerned about people's mental health. Six months of the problem, there will be nobody there to bother them in any way at all. Thank you. Okay, yeah. thank you. Hopefully, Mrs. Compton Cook will be reassured. Um, to, yes, Councillor Sochin. Um, yes, first a question about connectivity. Now, I noticed that um, the church in Greatly. Sorry, can we just stick with the show, show person? Oh, I thought we had gone no, on no, the general, no, 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 general no. topic. No, we're still. Uh, on the positioning of the show person site then. Well, I certainly don't have any problems with that suggestion. No, okay. Um, um, any other points? So can I ask if the board is it, it will approve the positioning of the travelling show person site as, as in the report? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, in terms of the extension of, as we heard, there were those three points that uh, Mr. Perry drew to our attention in terms of that extending beyond that red line in the, in the northern part of 7A. Uh, are the board happy to endorse that change? Any points? Any, anybody wish to speak against that? Parish Council representative here, and I'm afraid I can't remember whether the Parish Council had any particular comment about that. We can we can find out that. I think um, Mr. Perry may well be um, looking that up as we as we speak. But um, while he's doing that, I mean, I think um, although um, as Mr. Perry said it's a technical breach. The reason why we drew the line there in the first place um, has um, the issue has been addressed in relation to ensuring um, that separation buffer with the, the listed building. And ordinarily, we would draw a line on a defensible boundary, a hedge or a road or something that's, you know, you can see. So it's quite unusual that in this case to have, to have it going across um, a site and having a small slither of, of land uh, falling outside of, of the new settlement boundary. Um, so in, in some regards, in harm terms, providing um, the harm can be mitigated in relation to heritage, then um, the only harm is a harm in relation to pure policy, um, where the light, you know, it's breached the line. And in this regard, uh, um, officers feel that um, that isn't um, significant enough to warrant us bringing that back to that line. I don't know Mr. Perry has... Uh, For clarity, I personally have no problem with that at all, but I think that the, I'd like to just understand that we're not being asked to go against a strong local uh, body like such as a parish council. At this stage, um, I don't believe there were any significant op um, opposing views to that in principle. Um, we will, um, and I think Mr. Perry has indicated that I think uh, we haven't found that to, the, to, to this point. So I don't, I, th I can assure you that I think if there were some, um, you know, overwhelming local, discon well, effectively, um, dispute over that, then I think we would have uh, picked that up through the consultation sure, process. I personally have no problem no. with it for the reasons that you're describing, but it's just that in normal circumstances, 
the importance of a defined settlement boundary is very significant for local residents and particularly for the local parish council when they're considering anything yeah. related to that. I think, I think um, where we have that situation is, is predominantly where we have an existing built form, whereas there is no built form there now, that line has been drawn to draw around future built form. And of course, because of the nature of uh, the proposals that have come forward, um, we feel that extra probably 15, 20 metres is, isn't material and is probably better in urban design forms to follow the natural boundary, which is the hedge. Anybody else wish to speak against that? Okay, so the board's happy to endorse that change. Yes? Okay, agreed. And in terms of the prevention of the access from Morsham Hall Lane, anybody have any particular views against that? I mean, I support the officer's recommendation. Thank you. <coughs> I just wanted to clarify one aspect about what the, the objectives of, of this master plan actually would normally be. They would to have this clarified for the benefit of the developer and everybody else, rather than uh, hearing and understanding that the developer is not yet happy about this. <coughs> uh, and so I just wonder whether, whether, it's, whether we are, I mean, what you're telling us is that we're not really in a position <coughs> to approve a, a master plan which we know is in line with the developer's intentions. I mean, at this stage, um, the master plan provides the framework. Um, the developer has indicated that they will um, remove that link in relation to the issues that have been raised by the local planning authority and the highways authority. Um, at this point in time, um, and um, Ms Gore can um, come back um, in relation to the highway uh, issues, but I see no reason why we would defer from our analysis in relation to our planning application at this point in time. Yeah. There's not really much to add. Um, we um, don't want a, a secondary access to, um, to the site from the north because the, the main access via the roundabout can accommodate the self-build units, uh, so there's no need for a separate access. And we have got concerns about Morsham Hall Lane and the additional traffic because it's quite environmentally sensitive. It, it's narrow. Vehicles currently overrun the verges as it is. There's very little scope to do any widening. Uh, and really, um, environmentally, you wouldn't really want to do any widening. Uh, there's very little uh, room to do any passing places. And also, we don't want to encourage traffic to, to be running through the villages through Willows Green and then on through to, to rain through the A120. So we're, we're quite sort of like firm in our views on that. Um, and, and that's why I think we've got to the position at the moment where we have uh, made that as a, a comment in our recommendation to, to the planning authority that, that we wouldn't support um, an access at this location. Um, and the um, consortium has um, taken that on board. Uh, but but the, uh, the landowner obviously uh, would like that as an option um, and, and is considering putting it in the planning application. But um, unless there's very, very, very good reasons um, at the planning application stage, um, our view on that would, would remain at the planning application stage unless you know, they, can, they can demonstrate um, that they're, they're doing lots of mitigation and stuff like that, which I think is unlikely because of the nature of the road um, and the... Um, um, the usage of the road with the, the, the um, horses crossing on race day and, and you know the difficulties that there are with the existing situations so um, it's, I think it's unlikely that our view would change on that Okay so the board happy that the uh, content that the access from Molsham Hall Lane is removed from the master plan Yes Okay, okay that's agreed Okay um, Obviously, there are lots of further considerations that we mentioned in the um, report. Uh, so now we have an opportunity just to discuss uh, the wider implications. So, Councillor Soshin. Thank you, Chair. The, I, I'm concerned about the connectivity to existing um, community facilities in uh, Great and Little Lees. And I noticed the church is in Little Lees. And coming from 7A, 
and from School Lane. Um, perhaps you'd have to walk down Rectory Lane um, to the church. Perhaps there are community facilities going on there, but um, just highlights that different. I don't know if anybody can say, and perhaps the office, the highways office, can say whether Rectory Lane would be a suitable way to walk down to the church and any community facilities there. But I think it highlights to me the difficulty of, of connecting two community facilities there in other parts of um, um, Great Leeds. For example, the school, if the other school isn't built before the uh, first units, they'll be going down to the primary school in Aragon Road. But uh, I think a comment on the suitability. I know people would walk much further I've been reading Sherlock Holmes who said that what Dr. Watson went for a short walk of four miles this morning, <laughs> which is nothing people would do in the 20th century compared to the 19th. But, um, um, and I guess maybe we need to get back to walking those kind of distances and cycling, both for our health and, and to reduce carbon footprints. I think I'll just come into there with... Uh, if that's all right, Chair. I mean, the main services and facilities are in Great, in Great Lees Village itself. Um, and um, Great Lees and Little Lees, uh, Great Lees Church is a significant distance out of Great Lees Village. Um, and Little Lees Church um, is, um, well, Little Lees is a, a, quite a small um, settlement in its own right. And I don't think there's, there would be any other sort of way to get to that church, and, but I think the, the main issue is that the, both churches don't really have a focus of other community facilities within around them. It is the centre of Great Lees that is the focus of the recreation fields, the pubs. There is a church, uh, a, a, a different denominational church on, in Great Lees as well, uh, shops, um, the primary school, is, as, as Council Associates said. So th that's going to be the main focus and destination of those people that are wanting to walk and cycle to local facilities and we've talked about the crossing points and the accessibility in, in the presentation um, that you had. Yes, Councillor Pooley. <coughs> yes, on that, on that point, did I go to sleep by mistake? Did we talk about the bridge reservation? Not it? yet. We didn't. Would you like to talk about it now? <laughs> no, that's fine. <coughs> but it's a convenient point for me to say that within the, 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 the revised vision, there is a paragraph which is, which is really very strong about the desire to create one sense of community of the existing development and all of these new developments. <clears throat> so from that point of view, I, I am reassured on a number of aspects. I think I, the church was not something that I considered, but I think that within, uh, in terms of the connectivity with Great Lees and, <clears throat> and the new part of Great Lees and all of the new aspects that are being considered here, <clears throat> Then, uh, then I think that I uh, that I I, I I hear the officers when they say that in the vision. I believe that the the, the master plan uh, reflects that, and that's something which I hope is going to be at the centre of everyone's desire as the development takes place overall. And I will come back about the connectivity to further to the north. Yeah, I'm going to raise. And a number of points, but in general, I think the board would like to see greater evidence of the sustainability of the site, in particular the connectivity, as you were just mentioning, Councillor Pooley, to the existing communities in Great Lees and Black Notley. I also feel there ought to be an agreement between the de developers, similar to that on the Garden City, bringing forward the infrastructure, particularly that the connecting developments to the adjacent communities, um, they serve all the developments, yet uh, the developers would really have to come together to agree, otherwise it would seem to me that they're going to all fall on the developer of 7A, um, uh, and that there is no kind of shared agreement that who pays for each item of infrastructure, particularly those outside the... Um, uh, the, the parcels of land being developed um, and the timing of these, whether they should be in advance of the development or, or, or at least planned through the, with their developments. Um, uh, and this gives me a problem, 
perhaps I'll come to some more detailed points in a minute, but if that could be addressed, maybe uh, some aspect of this should be brought back to another meeting of this board in, in February. Um, uh, and I've feeling we may need to do that. It does strike me that um, this um, master plan was brought forward slightly prematurely with all these points of further consideration that, that I understand that the Office of Matthew Perry feels that they'll all be resolved in a couple of weeks and, uh, and a master plan with them resolved uh, being presented to us, say, in the beginning of February might be better. But then I, later on I'll go through the half a dozen points or so of particular things that were where they were addressed in the in the in the presentation to us of particular points of further consideration that I would like to see resolved before really it's presented to the cabinet who may not really have the time to go into the details that this board has. So is there sort of some agreement between the developers in terms of infrastructure or yeah I mean Starting on the point in terms of the connections to Great Lees, and uh, it's Great Notley, uh, Black Notley would be slightly distant, so Great Notley is where um, Tesco's and the new development there is. Um, I mean, we've spoken about the connections at Great Lees, and we've spoken um, in relation to that sort of a little bit longer trips in relation to probably cycling um, along London Road to Great Notley. So um, they are within the master plan, those... Um, those interventions in terms of um, in terms of actually funding those where you have off-site um, contributions then each developer would pay the kind of requisite um, tariff as it were towards um, contributions to off-site infrastructure that they're all that they're all actually uh, gaining um, um, some benefit from so um, and that's how we would deal with all of uh, any of those processes through the section 106 so it isn't that one developer or one site is being is contributing more than another it's 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 contributed in a proportional sense because if you've got a larger development you're going to need more infrastructure uh, smaller development is going to have less but if it's an off-site financial contribution then they're pulled together and pay for infrastructure that way thank you Back on that, well, I fear that these, if they're pulled together in section 106, the tendency is of them to, to only be available five or ten years after the bulk of the development. And that is a problem, particularly, say, the London Road improvements for the, uh, the I'd like to see those a lot earlier in the building sequence. Yeah, and that is just about the triggers um, um, in, re in relation to the 106. Okay, maybe if the members want to discuss the, the Chase Side Bridge situation. Um, clearly, at the moment, the Chase, Chase Side Bridge is not wide enough, I believe, for cyclists as, and pedestrians up into the normal standards. Um, what do people feel about the, the Chase Side Bridge? Yeah. I, think, I think for me, it, it, it came back into my mind because of the discussions about connectivity and the accessibility of local facilities to in both directions for the people within the Great Leaves and, and the people uh, in the new development. And so uh, that connectivity clearly needs to be part of the active travel aspirations of the, which are accurately reflected by the master plan. And so this bridge seems to me to play an important part in enabling both the, the most desirable forms of, of people getting from one place to another. So I, that view for me will carry forward very strongly into whatever future discussions there is about that. Yeah, just to, thank you, Chair. Just to agree with what Councillor Pooley has said, um, I think one of the comments that was made was that cyclists would have to dismount, I think, on one or more of the crossings. Just wondered how many of the crossings would they actually have to dismount on if the bridge, or the bridge obviously if it's not, um, improved but I think it's important to make um, travel and sustainable travel walking and cycling as attractive as possible so I would definitely agree with what Councillor Pooley has said. Thank you. Um, 
it may well be that um, I need some help from our highways colleagues, but um, my understanding is out of those four stars, um, it's only the, the third one down, which is Chase Side Bridge, which wouldn't automatically, you, you'd have to dismount. Um, so the top one's a Pegasus Crossing, the second one is an underpass, the third one is Chase Side Bridge, and the fourth one is School Lane. Um, so um, I, I think hearing earlier the developer um, or the promoter saying that you know we we can have a look at further uh, work at whether we can convert or do work to chase our bridge to create a cycling link as well so all four links would be cycling um, is welcomed but what I would also just make sure that the board are aware is that it has to be deliverable so um, it, you know we can't um, there's no point in us saying, well, we want a, a cycle bridge there and it's just not physically possible to do that um, because of deliverability issues in relation to, you know, third party land in particular. Um, um, but I don't know if um, um, Ms. Gold wants to come in on, on that matter. I think uh, Mr. Potter has, has outlined it, it um, um, very well. Um, Obviously, our preference would be for the Chase Side Bridge to be upgraded to have it as a pedestrian and cycle route. We've been having a lot of um, discussions with the consortium about that, uh, but we have to be realistic. It may not be achievable. Um, it's very welcomed that, that they've now agreed that they will look at it further um, because that, you know it, it would be much, much better if it can be a pedestrian and cycle link, but there are never any guarantees when you've got third-party land. So um, we know we'll do our best um, through the planning process to um, explore the options with, with the developer and, and try and see whether that is achievable. But uh, ultimately, it may not be, but um, with, with the proposals that the, the um, consortium are putting forward for, for the other ones, for the, for the at-grade crossing across the 131, which will be Pegasus, and the underpass, and um, school lane with improvements, hopefully, for um, pedestrians and cycling on road, um, there will be good connectivity between the, um, the proposed developments on 7A and the facilities uh, within, within Great Lees itself. So, you know, you, you have got four points and there should be good connectivity with crossings across Main Road um, by the underpass as well. So, um, you know, we, we will make sure through the planning that we, we get um, as good a connection as we can. Yeah, I mean, thank you for that. And I, I think what my concern uh, or my hope is that our strong feeling as a policy board as a whole, I don't think I'm putting words into people's mouth, that we support the highway's preference, that we support the planning of the, our planning officer's preference that this uh, fourth aspect of connectivity is achieved uh, for both cycling and pedestrian in that area. And that that strong preference goes forward to the cabinet and the cabinet approves the master plan if that's what it eventually does. Uh, with that strong preference reiterated. That's my hope. I'd like to come to the next point about a bus link to Black Knot, uh, is it Black Knotley? Black Knotley Employment and Supermarket and Doctors and the suggestion that, that really we should have a mobility centre within the neighbourhood centre. Now I know in uh, the Braintree district and, and possibly extending to the North Chelmsford there's a kind of it's a kind of dial-a-ride bus um, facility uh, that exists that uh, even if there isn't a formal um, uh, bus route, th there is some uh, work to try and achieve this, because it is a concern to me that people can't get to the employment area in, in, in Black Notley, the supermarket and the doctors. Um, and from this mobility link that's referred to in the uh, master plan, perhaps something uh, could be a base for this. Um, is it, it's like a dial-a-ride bus, isn't it, or something like that? It operates in the brain, largely in the Braintree district, but affects North Chelmsford. Um, at the moment, um, the details of the public transport um, proposals haven't um, been established you know in, in great detail um, we normally um, look at what um, the current bus service is to start with and where it goes to and what, what the connectivity is to, to local places like to Chelmsford and to Braintree including Great Notley and that local facilities um, 
in this instance, what we would do is the county council would take a section 106 contribution, which would be a significant amount, and that money would um, enhance existing services, probably provide new services, and it would, it would look at various options, what's the best thing to do, because sometimes in the early stages, it's better to have a, um, like a, a more, more like your um, dial ride kind of service. So it, it's, it's um, like a smaller service, and then as the development gets bigger, it can support a, a, a more sort of like regular service. So it probably will be a combination of things, um, but it's really too early stages to have sorted out those details now, because by the time the development goes ahead, you know, the existing services may have changed or, you know, it, it, we, we might be somewhere different to, to where we are now. So yes, we, we will look at various options for what's actually best for the development at that time, and it probably will be a combination of things. Um, and I'll just um, supplement that with, obviously, there is an existing bus route. Um, there's an existing bus route that goes um, along Main Road, London Road, connects to Braintree. Um, um, it's this, um, the bus route is the 770, yeah. So, I mean, it's a relatively frequent bus route um, in any case. Absolutely, it doesn't go to the supermarket, which is on the west side of the yeah. uh, Black Notley, and the employment area is even further west. Yeah, yeah and uh, um, yeah, I appreciate that. And um, the Digi bus service that is being tried, well, it's actually um, in operation in that area, um, does allow um, those kind of more bespoke um, demand um, sensitive routes, um, responsive routes. Um, so, but I think the point is that I think um, just going back to the convenience side of things, for convenience shopping, there will be a shop in the new neighbourhood centre for those people just to walk to. Um, if people want to go um, on a longer, uh, you know, a bigger shop, people do tend, obviously, they can go by uh, buses, one of those options, but I, I would say the majority of people probably go by car for, for their big shop, if it's a weekly or monthly shop. Um, so... Um, they wouldn't probably be, be trying to do their monthly shop on their bicycle, even though that might be <laughs> uh, what we would like them to do. They'd need a, a big basket. So there's so much in the, in the master plan that's being proposed that supports the ideal of, uh, of active travel. And so that's fine. But so just to say that actually, of course, most people go by car at the moment. And that is not a strong argument for not talking about this aspect of things. Uh, I mean, it seems to me that what we are, what, I'm very reassured by the comments that you'll be looking in detail of what is the best, uh, the best f uh, <coughs> use that could be made of Section 106 agreements or the further agreement of the bus company uh, and the route that's described in here. <coughs> but this has got to be the best option, if, the, if we to believe the master plan, the best option for new residents and existing residents of Great Lees. And it's those existing residents of Great Lees which have highlighted the fact that they're having to go by car to the supermarket and the secondary school and all the rest of it at the moment. And so from that point of view, there is an active travel goal here which has to be pursued other than by shrugging one's shoulders. I don't often accuse you of that, Jeremy, but... Um, <laughs> and so that's what I'm saying. And, and, the, and what I would like to see, I think it's the right place for me to propose this. Um, in, when I was going through this, uh, I, I came across the statement that the vision had changed from the original vision that we'd all seen before, which was a vision statement which was very succinct. And I inquired of, of, of Mr. Potter where the new vision is. Was I right in thinking that it was these four very long paragraphs uh, on whatever, the section, whatever it is? And one of those paragraphs talks very much about the active travel and the connectivity aspirations, if I remember rightly. And I would like to see at the end of that a phrase which says, including the appropriate connectivity with the facilities uh, in the southern part of the Braintree District, or however you want to describe that. So I'm not asking you to define what those are. I'm just saying that it needs to be in the vision for uh, the development and the, and the consequent impact on the, the wider area. That's what I'd like to see. Yeah, could I just add about the shopping? I these convenience stores uh, can often sell things at a, at a premium to what you can get in the really cheap. So people who are moving into our new, uh, the new affordable social houses there and really having to get to the supermarket indeed frequently because they can't afford to have the monthly shop, but they need to go to a cheap supermarket 
And that may not be the case, uh, that the convenience store may not be as cheap. It, it, it might be, but anyway. Okay. Um, no, no. Um, any any other general points? Uh, yes. No. I'm just trying to think how we're wording it. Um, <laughs> I mean, I guess we, we are looking for for strong, active links uh, from the from this development to the Notleys, um, but I guess we are looking to Essex County Council and the Section 106 agreement to, to put that in place, yeah? The bus, the bus company will have a role, won't it? I mean, it's part of, it's part of their obligations to see whether they can be persuaded to uh, circumnavigate different places as they do now in Chelmsford. Uh, so they, they, they will have a role as well, the conversations with the bus company. Uh, and, the, and the section 106 uh, the contribution, fine. And then whatever else we can dream up, the county council's own active travel plans have a budget which they occasionally apply in certain directions. So that would be <coughs> that would be good as well. I wasn't trying to be too specific. Can I say something, Chair? Yes, sure. I, I think there's a danger here. We're falling between what the master plan's objective is doing, doing and what we do at plan application stage. Now, the plan application stage will look at the details of the design strategy coming forward and look at the appropriate bus links, the appropriate accessibility. I think our objective here in this uh, master plan is actually encourage the right accessibility, encourage that accessibility should be a primary consideration when it comes to plan application stage. I don't think we can be too specific at this stage. I do accept that if you're concerned about some of the vision, we can widen that out. But one of the things we can't do is actually address some of the deficiencies in the existing village. When we actually get into 106, it's about actually the needs of this development. That's what 106 has got to be tailored to. So it's about what is the particular needs or what this development generates, and that's what 106 can only be, will, will relate to. So there are efficient, deficiency at the moment in the village. We can't really address that unless it relates to the existing development. I understand that, but the plan quite rightly describes the vision for this, uh, this master plan to encourage the overall uh, future of the Great Lees village and area. So, so there is a little, con a little bit of a contradiction in there, but presumably it's still liable in this, uh, this whole thing. So there are other ways of, of, of things that may benefit Great Lees itself, which if they were tied in with other bus suggestions could be pursued. I am deliberately trying not to be too specific for the very reasons that that you're saying, Mr. Green, I, mean, it's, it's, I think, but, but that specific paragraph in the vision is a good paragraph, and it just needs that clause saying that including where appropriate links with the part that we've been talking about. Um, sorry, Chair, through, through you. Um, so, um, yeah, we can, we can ask for that to be strengthened. Of course, cr creating um, good, active, and sustainable um, connections to local destinations is key and we can, and we can strengthen um, that without you know specifying exactly what that's going to be and I think I'm, it's I'm, right I'm, I'm, trying, I'm not trying to specify exactly what no it's no going no to be. absolutely the and existing I agree with you. paragraph yeah. is really great yeah. it simply is limited to the the, the, the great Lees area and doesn't refer to the and I think what I'm saying is well I am saying is that we can extend that to destinations uh, beyond Great Lees, and that would be in particular to the north, yeah. Chair, would it be helpful if I just read out the section of the vision? Um, I can't present that on the screen, but I think that one of the latter bullet points says, accommodate bus services together with new bus stops to ensure good sustainable connections from Great Lees to Chelmsford and Braintree. So I think um, if, it's that, if it's that paragraph that Mr. Mr. Pooley is, is looking at extending, then... Um, I'm sure we can come up with some I'm words that would... Um, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with the Highways Officer's comments. I'm saying that the vision needs to embrace that as well. OK, so is the Board happy that we just uh, strengthen up that vision to you know, really emphasise good, active links, sustainable links uh, to not Liz to the north and Chelmsford to the south where we're applicable? Yeah. Board happy with that? Yeah. Councillor Willis. Could I, in particular, 
Um, forgive me if this isn't the right moment, but I'm finding it difficult tonight to know when the right moment is. Um, but um, I would like to express a welcome for the board, some board features of these plans across the whole of the, you know, the, the, the different sites. First of all, that they are being addressed as a group in very much the same way, in the same spirit, it seems to me, as the excellent master plan we have approved last time for um, the Garden Village. And yet they haven't got the advantage of the additional funds that the Garden Village will attract. Um, in particular, I'd like to welcome the care with which they've um, established the historical assets and also the local ecology, which seems to me to be quite unusual. The fields are smaller than typically, um, and therefore to retain the hedgerows as it intended will be very um, significant. Um, and I speak as somebody who was greatly grieved when a neighbour took out a whole lot of hedgerows, which were not dissimilar, um, and with no good reason. Um, so um, I'd like to welcome that. Um, and, um, you know, I'm glad that, they, that all of that is in mind. And it will improve, I'm sure, the quality of the development for everybody who lives there. Um, so, um, yes, I, I think there's a lot to be said for the, the, the board approach in, in the report. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, my... Well, almost the last subject. The, um, um, the, the comment, I'm mean, talking about 3.64 and 3.65. It talks about the alternative meters for powering the buildings. Gas boilers have to be phased out. Um, um, and probably most of these houses um, will be built. They, and they probably ought to design them now without the gas boilers because they can't be sure with a recession coming precisely when they will be built. Um, so I'd like to see a commitment to looking at alternatives here. Commitments to rainwater harvesting, standards of insulation, position of houses so solar panels can be or, or are fitted, and electric vehicle charging. Now some of these um, uh, goes beyond what we can get commitments to, but a, again, a kind of vision here that they would do their best in these environmental matters, helping towards carbon neutral. Um, with all these electricity, again, uh, they will need to have uh, greater power connections. I hope that they have envisaged that for the um, uh, electric vehicle charging, and if they are, um, uh, powering um, ground source heating, this kind of stuff, it all requires greater heat, uh, electricity supply. So I, I would like a kind of vision on here more than is, as is said in the master plan, uh, the vision that we have at the moment is very sketchy in this area, and I'd like them, as we have done in other master plans, to be uh, kind of more commitment, committed in this area without, again, being too specific, uh, otherwise, uh, uh, Mr. Green will say we, that's a matter for the um, uh, planning application, but a kind of vision here to do the best they can. I, hopefully going on about what the government requires, but, uh, but uh, recognising that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I mean, I'll start and... Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Chair, uh, Chair sorry. I just wanted to, to note in response that one of the further considerations is... Uh, request a dedicated section to discuss sustainable development initiatives. So um, this is recognised by officers um, and w in informally I have agreement with, um, with, with the agent and, and developers consortium that that will be addressed in a, in a revised se section um, to hopefully address council associations and, and, and others' um, concerns on that point. I think, I think Mr Potter just wanted to make a further comment in relation to um, the Garden community. We just need to be conscious in terms of 
um, taken this a step beyond um, what any other master plan uh, uh, has had to uh, has had to do, and that recognition of the garden community was was a slightly different uh, element that we were dealing with previously. Um, yes. So, um, as Mr. Perry said, um, I think it's a little bit. Um, I think it's fair to compare it with the other strategic sites that we've been dealing with. The garden community is slightly different in the sense that it is a kind of a national exemplar, um, and it's trying to push the boundaries even further than. Um, you know, um, any other site in, um, in the area or either, actually in the country. So um, I think what we need to remember is things like we do have our existing policies, we have our Making Places SPD, um, our policies is, uh, you know, our existing adopted policy is for every new home to have an EV charging point anyway. So we have the, you know, a number of tools already in the toolkit to enable us to do this and also the fact that as this development comes forwards um, you know building regulations um, are going to be moving forward at quite a pace and therefore um, um, even if this um, development was um, not going quite as far as the garden community it would still be um, going towards that net zero ready development which is the 2025 standard uh, that's coming forward um, through uh, the building regulations. So I think it's fair to say that um, it probably, we need to maybe have a look at strengthening um, and making that a little bit clearer in the master plan um, that we're looking at the same requirements as we are on all of our strategic sites. And if that isn't clear in the master plan, then that needs to be. Thank you, Chair. I think I'm gonna shut up but on, but on, on this point. Uh, thank you uh, for drawing our attention to the, to the proviso in the master plan that's proposed to us that it needs an additional section uh, to cover this and other aspects of sustainability. Uh, good, I'm glad to hear that. I think that was a, I was surprised that it wasn't up there as the fourth of the three, a fourth of the three things that needed further further elaboration. And uh, so my question is, where is that? Where and when is that additional section going for its approval? I suppose, I suppose that's a question back to um, you, you as members, really, as to how you would wish to deal with it. Obviously, the recommendation from officers is that uh, members delegate this um, through, um, um, through, through through our director and, and officers to deal with changes before proceeding to, to Cabinet. That's obviously um, how we've worked previously um, to deal with changes is that normally, um, Chair, you would, you would nominate key members of, uh, of the board um, to be in dialogue with officers to get that agreed um, in terms of specific wording changes. So um, I, I believe we can entertain a similar format to do that if, um, if members so agree. I think Councillor Poole's question was where was it going? I think, was that? Yeah, I mean, there's an existing section within the document. Um, as I say, um, it probably needs to be uh, supplemented um, and to ensure that um, the objectives that we've tried to achieve on all of the strategic sites are actually in, embedded in, within there. But it's, it's a, effectively additional text to the, the, the section within um, the existing master plan. section at uh, page 88 that talks about complying with current policy, future building regulations and packet first. It's a bit short, and, you know, it can be beefed up with wider objectives. The way that we use the word sustainability these days is much broader than that, isn't it? Uh, and so I read, when I read the statement in the master plan that's proposed to us that it needed the extra section that Mr. Perry is referring to, I thought good, because it certainly does need to, to, to underline the various aspects that go towards a sustainable development, each of which has its own detailed consideration in some other places. And that's why I was pleased with Mr. Perry's suggestion that it needed a, an additional section. That was what my question was about. And I think going to exactly to that point, uh, the different facets of sustainability need to be, they are covered within that master plan. Many of them are covered within that master plan, but they need to be brought possibly together a little bit more to ensure that um, there's an overall uh, approach to sustainability that I think um, Councillor Pooley is referring to. And, and maybe it's a question of looking again at the vision statement as it now exists, because it certainly gets a mention in there to the best of my recollection. 
uh, but the vision statement now, co now covers an awful lot of ground, doesn't it? And there isn't, a, there isn't something which captures the vision for this development anymore. Chair, yeah, I think I'd, I'd explain, I think page 86 deals with the integrating sustainability. Obviously, there's a couple of key themes within there. Uh, housing is one of those. Um, I think we could include an additional um, paragraph within that section, as well as expanding the housing element uh, within within a red box it's shown. So I think that you know, we've got the ability to, to change that page, certainly, um, to pull out what, what Councillor Pooley is talking about. Okay, so the board notes that we would be looking for a stronger wording with regards to sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question for this stage or a later stage, but it's quite specific around the services and facilities. So just noting that there's a new primary school, but I think it's noted that Will, the plan is to use the existing doctor surgery in Great Notley. Are there any concerns about the capacity of using an existing doctor surgery, or um, or make that change at a later date, or will it be looked at at a later date in the process? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, as part of the neighbourhood centre, there is a proposal for a new GP surgery, um, which has varying degrees of, of success. So. It is proposed to um, have a new facility within there. Um, we do have NHS consults on, on board at this early stage, so um, that has very much been welcomed by them. Um, obviously, there are intrinsic difficulties in potentially filling those spaces, but certainly there's a, there's a willing from landowners in terms of neighbourhood centre ownership. Um, <clears throat> there's a policy requirement and also NHS support for that. So um, you know, that, that is not unusual that we would deal with this size of site with additional surgery um, within the neighbourhood centre specifically. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a point from uh, Councillor Raven, who unfortunately uh, couldn't be, be here with us this evening. Um, he says, on site 7B and 7C, the residents on Banters Lane are concerned that the planning application has been submitted, as, that has been submitted for this site, has a three-storey main uh, community building, which residents are concerned would tower over their properties, which have been limited to one and a half storeys in their planning applications. Um, so I just wondered if you could um, speak to that, please. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. I'll just pull up a, an image, if I may, in a second of. Um 7B and C. <coughs> I think, in short, um, Chair, there is, um, it, it, was, it was a concern um, shared by officers. Um, so the revised master plan does seek to address um, the scale across um, both um, North 7C, which you see at the bottom of the aerial, as well as um, Bantersfield, <coughs> which breaks into 7B, um, north of that um, hedgerow uh, tree line that you see on the aerial photograph. So there was a concern um, from officers as well as local residents in, in that respect that perhaps three storey is not the most appropriate scale for that parcel. It's on the northern periphery of the existing village. I think you know that, that has now been changed. Um, so that we get more of a blanket two-storey um, within the within the, the scale diagram within the master plan, uh, with the potential for a key, uh, a, a couple of key 
feature buildings, perhaps that that, sp that split the the application site, um, which is 490 units, and something further south um, to be around a Suds um, open space area. So we think there is some potential for for three storey. Um, however, you know we, we sought to address that with a revised diagram now and we would acknowledge that that should be predominantly two-storey across across um, 7C and into 7B. Uh, uh, the paragraph 356, I mean, the, the proposal is you're changing the wording to some three-storey elements. Um, so we're, we're removing the up to 25%. Yes, Chair, that is, um, is one of the amendments and one of the further considerations that we're seeking uh, endorsement for. We support that, Chair. Yeah. Right, so there are a significant number of further considerations that have been mentioned in the report. Uh, unless anybody has any specific concerns about those, Mr Perry, can we, as a board take reassurance that all those considerations will be put in place and there's, there's nothing controversial about them? As yes, you yes thank you, Joe. I think, I think the only one um, highlighted was uh, Chaseside Bridge by Mr Daniels. Um, you know, we've heard uh, a debate about, about that today, I think, but even then there is a commitment to the further investigative work um, before we um, kind of present to, to Cabinet. So um, I'm assured from the developers' um, side that they're in agreement um, in terms of the further considerations uh, that have been outlined in the report. And obviously members um, will, will, will take my assurance that there will be changes made to the document to address each, each of those, uh, as well as the normal you know, typographical errors and other things that are pulled out by highways and education and so forth. So um, hope that you can take that assurance from Officers, um, Chair, I mean, the, compared with other uh, 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 master plans, the changes are so significant, so many. I think we'd like to see this brought back to uh, February, the was, uh, February the 28th meeting, which is ahead of the cabinet meeting, to see these changes and not taken direct. To cabinet, but I, I'm not really. I, I'm certainly not keen to, to recommend the um, the master plan as I see it now, and um, and uh, would like to see those those changes that have been discussed by Officer Perry and other officers brought forward, and we can see them all put together briefly on, say, February the 28th or some other time. Um, uh, right. Would it, is it the case that we can, there will be time to see it on the 28th? Or? Well, first of all, I mean, 28th has, it's quite a, um, a number, well, two quite significant um, agenda items on there. Um, and to add um, a third, I would be slightly concerned, um, seeing as that we try to, um, just have the um, master plans on their own at, uh, at board meetings. I think, I think my, my, my taking and listening to the debate, I mean, there were a number of things that um, um, members discussed, but actually, actually when we boil it down, um, I'm not as sure there are as many contentious issues really here um, that can't just be dealt with through the normal... The normal route. Uh, that would be my feeling. Um, as Mr. Perry said, Chase Side Bridge is the is the kind of is a bit of a uh, an outlier there. But I think uh, and I hope members could see that there were a number of different alternatives. If if Chase Side Bridge was the only bridge or only a connection across the A131, then I think we would be in a very very different situation. What you've seen tonight is four, well five, if you. Uh, include the one by the uh, travelling show person's site, but four main connections, three of those that will be cycling connections. So 
obviously we will absolutely do our best with the, our currency colleagues to ensure that we get a fourth, but I don't see that as being something um, that is so contentious that we would need to go round uh, another cycle of, of, of consideration by the board, but obviously that's for the board to decide itself. I mean, it may not be that this will occupy a lot of time at the next meeting. Um, or I guess it will be a case of checking to make sure that all those changes are in place and that we are just reassured that everything's in place to uh, be presented to Cabinet. Uh, but what, what does the Board think? Well, I would like to see that even circulated in some other way and uh, agreed. Um, uh, uh, signed off in some other way, but we are happy um, with the, these changes and it, uh, we still don't have the whole list of you know, points for further consideration ahead of uh, the Cabinet meeting, which will go to Cabinet meeting in March sometime, I guess. Uh, The next one's 14th of March. Well, it'll be 14th of March. 14th of March, yes. <laughs> you know, I think, therefore, there's time for this is to happen in some way or other. I mean, you can work on the, the way of doing it. Can I be clear about the concerns you have? Because we've always said that you'll look at the vision, you'll em embrace some of the changes Council approved, you'll look at the integrating s sustainability. We went through some of the changes which uh, Matt hi highlighted, and we, we agreed all, all, all of those. I appreciate we're going to look at the cycle bridge, and the, but I don't think we'll be able to resolve that probably be before uh, February. So I'm, I'm just. Well, I'm, not that I'm not too worried about that, in that individual one. It is just seeing it and not, you know, passing our job on to the cabinet. We we'll see that we have something uh, uh, cast our eye over over this uh, with these visions. That's what I feel anyway. I don't know how my colleagues feel. Thank you. Councillor McCraw, oh, Councillor Pooley. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think Andrew hinted at a possible way forward here, and that is that we would, he would like us to see it in some form or other, so that, <clears throat> so that we are reassured, and so that, uh, and so that because this, this contains more quite significant changes as a document than the, the normal method of agreeing uh, typographical errors and minor, minor consequential amendments and so on that would normally take the place. But I think that there's enough general agreement here with the thrust of it, uh, enough general agreement with the specific decisions that we've discussed uh, to be happy that we don't necessarily need a full-blown debate about it. But what I do want to happen is that uh, the Cabinet is as informed as we are able to make it of our final position on this master plan. And that's a slight change from normal practice. And I think it, re I mean, although, although uh, Councillor Thorpe is doing a great job over here, I mean, I'm sure some of his colleagues may have uh, interest in some of these. And we don't want the, the Tory spokespeople to arrive at Cabinet to come up with all sorts of things that we can't, uh, we can't say that we've discussed. We need to be as clear as we can be in saying to Cabinet we recommend this. That's what I'm saying. So, I mean, as I see it, um, two options, really. Um, first option is um, for it to come back on the 28th as a kind of a very focused item just on key changes, um, which could be a possibility. Um, and the second option is we circulate it outside of the meeting for um, members to uh, form a judgment um, or agree um, those changes. Um, because I've got my uh, cabinet um, dates slightly muddled up there, I mean, in some regards, it wouldn't make a, an enormous amount of difference. The only thing is that, obviously, um, I'm, Daniel might be able to advise me when the cabinet agenda is needed to be published and so forth, and um, it probably wouldn't be um, too far after. Um, yeah, OK. So, um, providing we can uh, get agreement there, then I think they're the two options available uh, open to members at this point.
Chair, could I just make a point in terms of, um, obviously the developer is not permitted to speak here, but I don't really want to talk on their behalf, but it is worth noting, obviously, to go with Mr. Potter's option one does require those amendments probably to be done within the next two weeks. That is not without its challenges. Um, I am assured that it, that it can happen if necessary, because um, obviously um, the developers consortium have an eye on potentially cabinet in, in March in any case. Um, so I say I just wanted to float that that there is um, there is some constraint, albeit I think we can we can achieve that because obviously the print date works back from uh, five clear days from the 28th of February. So um, time is is very limited in that respect. Before we make that decision, Councillor McCroy, did you want to say anything or? Well, I, thank you, Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to address the board. Um, I, I was going to make some rather general points, but I, I'll address this latest um, suggestion towards the end of my remarks, if I may. Um, so obviously, this, uh, this master plan is a, a different scale to the garden community master plan, which we looked at last time. But it does nevertheless uh, contribute significantly towards the council's uh, meeting its, um, its, its um, housing allocation as is in the current local plan, the adopted local plan, and indeed the, um, the demand for, for new homes, which we are very aware of. Uh, plus, of course, we do have the obligation to provide travelling show persons homes, so as far as that goes, we are um, fully meeting some of our obligations. But it's, it's worth saying that it has been uh, mentioned by others that the same development principles uh, do apply here uh, in terms of sustainable development, generous open space, retained hedgerows and trees, or replacement trees um, where that is required, um, as well as the pedestrian cycle routes within the development and beyond. We've, ha we've had all these assurances so I thank the board for their contributions and that's why we take these master plans through this process. Um, but I, th I would like to think that members have that assurance from our officers um, that with the agreement of your chair, your vice chair, maybe one other, uh, plus myself and senior officers, that these, these concerns will be addressed if it satisfies, if you actually need t to be satisfied that it's actually happened to the wider board, I'm sure that can be, be circulated. I'm, personally, I'm not sure it's necessary just to, to come to the board and say, yes, we have accepted all your uh, concerns. Here they are in black and white. But if that's what the board wants to do, um, well, that's, that's their decision. But, as we said, you know, these, these other um, items can be resolved through the Section 106 agreements, and that is, that is the normal process. So um, I, think, I think the board, in broad terms, is, is happy with uh, what is proposed in the master plan. So I hope that you know, we can get on with this without too much delay, because it is a delay, and we don't want to delay the, uh, the start of this housing development. Thank you. Well, the, so the option, so what other board members think in terms of this coming back to the next board as a very sort of focused point that um, shouldn't cause us too much time. Is that, anybody want to speak I mean, against my, that? My, or? my personal view is that it's professional for us to ask that and unprofessional to suggest that it's not appropriate. That option for our but I defer to the other councillors here. Anybody have any views against or <laughs> Councillor Ayres? I'm happy with that. Have to come back. Yeah. yeah, as long as it's a brief yes. item. Okay. Right. okay, do you want to make a proposal then or? Like, uh, a uh, proposal that the, the master plan inv involving the, the changes as discussed this evening is uh, brought back before the February 
28th meeting as a very focused item on those changes. Thank you, Chair. Seconder? Second, Chair. Okay. Is everybody in agreement with that? Anybody against? Okay. Thank you very much. Good. Okay. So, just before you move on, I'd just like to support Mr. McCrory's conclusion that, that, this, that I certainly, and I think the, the board as a whole, is thoroughly in favour of what's uh, the, of the progress so far, and don't want any delay to this moving forward either. Uh, I wouldn't want the, the consortium representative here to go away with the sense from the fact that we discussed a lot of items in great detail and made a couple of demands here or there, or strong preferences here or there, to detract from our thanks for all the hard work that's gone into this. There's been a very extensive consultation and involvement of local residents and the parish council. I'm very aware of that. And, it, and, and that's been worthwhile because it has resulted in some changes, significant changes, even so far from the versions that we've seen in draft form before. So I'd just like that message to be loud and clear. Thank you. Okay, so the other item is the work program. Um, any comments? No. So you've got the outline of the work program there for the next meeting. Yes. There wasn't much more I was going to say um, because I think we we kind of uh, trailed it actually in the debate. But I mean, um, we've only got. Um, up until the 28th because uh, um, obviously there's a, a, the elections coming up um, so we felt to uh, have the work program um, fully populated after after that time and going forwards but um, the two items as, as I said the review the feedback on the review of the adoptive local plan and the consultation responses to the national uh, planning policy changes and alongside uh, um, this uh, the brief item that uh, will come back in relation to Great Lee's master plan. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, members. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.